Any, um, I think we're still uh, some stragglers coming in, but um, any questions about anything in the news or uh, anything on anything on the news? The last couple of days have been relatively quiet, is that right? I think it's something has, uh, the world has not caved in yet. Um, <clears throat> we'll see, I guess, what happens this week in Congress, but uh, we may have more interesting things to talk about next week. But um, any, any uh, news, news of interest in the world or any questions about uh, last lecture? We were talking about things about uh, about random walks and, th and uh, how you generate you know random numbers and things like that. Any questions or comments here? Okay, um, I'd like to, uh, there's gonna be two announcements I'd like to make. One, um, I just wanna warn you that we are going to be having a, uh, the <clears throat> first homework will probably come out in about a week on options pricing. We're going to have to write programs to price options and uh, evaluate them. So that's just a warning that uh, that's happening. The other thing that I would like to do is remind people that today there is a lecture at the, in the business school at 345 in the Lamu Lecture Theater. Okay, And I'd like to make this officially a required lecture. Okay, for people who go, okay, um, what, for whatever that means. One thing that means is that if I feel a need morally where I have to miss a class at some point, I'll say that you've had this as a required lecture, and it balances it out. But uh, although I don't yet know that I'm going to be missing anything. But um, I do recommend people go, because this is about the uh, market, you know, the market situation, and you'll get a different perspective from, maybe a different perspective from hearing what business school faculty are thinking about it and how they see it. And um, I will be going, and I hope everybody else will be able to make it. Any questions about that? OK? Remind me at the end of class to remind, announce that to all the stragglers. Somebody remind me about that. OK, so let's get started. Um, we've been talking uh, last class about, uh, we were talking about uh, random walks and uh, Monte Carlo methods and things like this. And um, in particular, one of the classic ideas of, uh, of the outline of what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit more about some of the technology behind Monte Carlo methods and random walks. Okay? I want to then show you an example of a model of, of prices I once built using Monte Carlo random walks, just to give you an idea of what that these things do have some predictive power and what they get right and what they get wrong. And then I'm gonna talk about why random walks are a bad idea and there's something else that's better, that's somehow using the same kind of ideas. Okay, so that's sort of my vision for the next couple of days. In today's class, it maybe it'll go beyond that. But um, when we talk about Monte Carlo methods, the classic Monte Carlo method is something called Monte Carlo integration, okay? where let's say you wanted to figure out, let's say that you had a painting by Picasso, okay, and this was what the painting looked like, and this thing was colored red, okay, and you wanted to know what fraction of the painting was red, okay, how would you go about doing it, okay? If you want to know the area of the painting, it's pretty easy to figure out because it's a rectangular painting, right? It's length times width, right? And, um, but this, this funny squiggly shaped thing, how do you find the area of that, okay? You don't have the, four, it, it's kind of a mathematic, you know, you could say, well, we're going to do an integral of it. But for one thing, it's not a closed form. There's no formula for you to do an integral over. All you've got is a painting. So how might you find the area of that? If you use the ideas from last class, you might think of the following kind of an idea. What if we were to shoot random numbers at it? Okay, or equivalently, take our painting and throw darts at it randomly. Okay, I'm gonna close my eyes and shoot dots at it. See if my eyes are closed. And because it's random, okay, I miss the board sometimes. But what would we expect if I'm shooting random darts at this thing? We would expect that the fraction of darts that hit the red versus what hits the white should be roughly equal to the ratio of the um, area of the red 
to the area of the white, right? And so counting how many darts hit is just a counting problem, okay? It's are you within that region testing, okay? And so this is a technique called Monte Carlo integra integration for finding areas of things, okay, by doing random sampling. Any questions about that? It ties into what we've been talking about so far because, again, it's about using a random sampling technique to try to compute something. We wanted to compute what's the probability distribution of the price of an option. Here we're computing something different, an integral, by using random numbers. Okay? Any questions about this idea? I assume this is people are getting get that a basic idea. Now I ask you a question. Okay? Is random if, if you're gonna is it really the best way to compute this painting, the area of this painting? To shoot random numbers darts at it? Or might there be a better pattern of darts to shoot at it? If you want to figure out the area of this. Okay? People get the idea, I hope, that how, how when we shot random numbers at it, we counted the number of dots, dots in it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We shot a total of one, two, three, well, we don't count the ones that are outside. We also missed with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That means we got nine out of nine plus twelve. That's an argument that uh, 9 21st, okay, or 3 7 of the area is covered by this blob. That was how we did the Monte Carlo integration, correct? Now I ask you a question. Were random numbers the right thing to use for this? Okay, yes or no? Okay, if you wanted to find the area here, might there be a better pattern of numbers than just random? Okay? Anyone think of what might be a better pattern of numbers to use for this kind of an application? Okay. What? A uniform distribution. What if, let's say, is there some reason why random numbers, the random pattern is better than an equally spaced grid of things, okay? Another way we might have used our dots, okay? If we stop and think about it, we could have actually just plopped down a grid of points over this thing. If you want to sample 100 points, plop a 10 by 10 grid over it, okay? And then sample at those grid points. <laughs> Does everybody see that that's another alternative for this kind of a problem, okay? And which would likely be better? Okay. Let's think about that. Does anyone have a vote on this? Which one would likely be better? Okay. In principle, it seems to me the uniform thing has some advantages. For one is that when you do something randomly, you're going to get clustering. Okay. And there is no reason why the inherent clustering of what you do Okay, when you do it, uh, the, the, the place where you put the clusters correspond to something meaningful on the shape that you're trying to integrate. Does that make sense? So, in one sense, random numbers are good because they're simple and they capture the distribution and that is good. But if we think about it, it might seem that uniform sampling is better, okay? Any questions about that? That's sort of a little bit of a dilemma here. And that gets us into this idea of quasi-random sequences. So one question, we talked about how you generate random numbers. Okay? Maybe we would like to try to, it would be for most things, but for certain kinds of applications, it would clearly be better if we filled space more uniformly than randomly. Okay? If we really want to sample it. Now, what is wrong with doing the integration with u uniform, a uniform grid of points? One problem is that you need to know the grid size in advance, okay? 
If you're sampling a figure, let's say that, that, that you're sampling my blob, perhaps a uniform grid would do a good job, right? But perhaps you're sampling something where there is very little red, okay? And now, most of your darts, if you first say, well, I'm going to shoot a certain number of darts at it, it might be that all the darts miss. And you don't really have as accurate a bounds on your estimate as you might like. One thing you would like to do now is perhaps shoot more darts at it. So one of the good things about random sampling is you can, in principle, have a logical way to keep shooting more dots at it. Okay? As many dots as you need. Okay? Once you've decided to use a grid, and you've decided you didn't get enough sampling, what is your next step going to be? Okay? It's not clear how you insert more points into this thing. So that the distribution at the end, when you've inserted all your points, okay, still is relatively random. Does that make a certain amount of sense? So there is this other field of generating what we would call quasi-random sequences, where the goal might be to fill up space more uniformly than random uncorrelated points, but still do it in an incremental manner. So the more that you shoot in, the more uniform it still looks like it's, the, 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 the fact it still looks uniform at any point doing it, okay? And so what I want to convince you is that there is, you know, that, that, that this is an idea that makes sense, okay? If you can find a generator that will generate your random numbers in this sort of quasi-uniform distribute, quasi-random sequence, okay? Any questions about it? Just to give you an idea, how might we if we wanted to generate points on a line, and I want you to generate them as uniformly as possible, without knowing how many I'm going to put down, what order might you put them in? Just think a little bit about this. Could you come up with, I'm not going to tell you, I want you to put down n points on this line as uniformly as possible, but I'm not going to tell you n. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to put down points on the line as uniformly as possible, and I'm going to tell you when to stop. What might be a way that you could do this? Okay, a procedure to do this, to get some kind of an intuition about this. Okay. Where should the first point go? Middle. Okay. Where might the second point go? Where here? You know, maybe you put it here, and then here. So one possible idea might be that if you repeatedly divided each the largest interval in half, that would give you as evenly a spaced distribution as you could hope to get under this kind of a model. Does that make sense? Now the trouble is, of course, if you insert them in this order, it's not going to look like a random sequence because you're going to have possibly twice as many points on this side at some point as you do on the other side. And your points are sort of going to be going in runs of increasing things. So it's not quite uniform yet. It's not random-like. But what a quasi-random number generator would like to do is some trick like that while still putting the points in in some kind of a more arbitrary, less systematic order than what we're doing now. So the bottom line is there are generators like this, and these can be useful for, um, what you call it, for, for, for doing these kind of simulations. Any questions about the idea of quasi-random generators? Okay, so that's an interesting idea. Let me show you one other idea about um, random walks, okay? And to note that a random walk is sort of a random process where we're going to pick the next move according to some probability distribution. The walks we talked about so far had the property that they were independent, okay? That the next move, okay, is, um, is independent of what the previous moves were, 
Okay, we, you know, we, we picked, the, the, you know, we had a random walk, blah, 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 blah. And from this point, okay, we picked the next step, independent of our path, okay? Now, a lot of when people talk about the market, they talk about the market as going up or going down. And that sort of implies that there's sort of some kind of a force that is acting on it. Right? There is some kind of a notion of momentum. And you might very well think that if the stock market went up yesterday, there is a better likelihood it will go up to today. Okay? If the walk depends upon memory, we can imagine a process where the next step is not independent of the previous step. Okay, that there is some memory in the process. Okay, and this would describe an alternate sort of idea that we might generate sort of random walk series. So what we will call a Hearst random walk is a discrete random walk which reverses direction with probability H. This is a little bit different than what we said before. Before we had this idea that um, with a probability of, you know, we would say there was a probability P of going up and a probability of 1 minus P of going down. Here we're talking about a world where the next step, okay, is going to be made with a, be the same as the previous step with a probability H, okay, and reverse with probability 1 minus H. So what does that mean? If, those, if we assume that H is greater than a half, okay, because that's really where it be, for the, what, what is it if we reverse direction with probability one half? What would that walk look like? It would look like our random independent walk, right? If we reverse direction with a probability one half, Really, the, the next step is going to have no dependency on the previous step, right? There's a 50% chance, if, you know, if the last step was up, there's a 50% chance we're going to do it, which means we have a 50% chance we'd go up. If the last step was going down, there would be a 50% chance of going down, right? So with a probability of H equals 1, of 1 half, we have an independent walk. Does everybody see that? What if H was equal to 1? What would the random walk look like if H was equal to 1? Okay. It would all depend upon what? The first movement. Does everybody see that? We have to initialize it with a movement. Suppose it went up. Then from now on, every move is going to be the same as the previous one it would shoot up consistently. Not very interesting, right? But if we have a value somewhere between one half and one, what we've got is a, um, I think I get that right, wrong direction, oh uh, no, I think it, oh uh, well, okay. bingo. If I had it between one half and one, you get an interesting property where there is some, it is still going to have the property it can go up, it can go down. Okay, in fact, there's no real bias, actually, in the long run. The, the, the expected value of it is basically still going to be neutral. Okay? But what's interesting is the runs of, of consecutive things is going to be longer on average than with an independent walk. Right? What's the probability of getting a run of length three with a regular walk? Okay, three straight heads. Well, it was the probability of a head times the probability of a head times the probability of a head, right? Okay. Now here, you know, what's the probability of getting or plus the probability of a tail times a tail times a tail? That's the probability of three in a row, right? Here, whatever the first one is, that's neutral. The probability of the second one being the same as H, and the third one as being H, okay? The probability of getting a long run is going to be higher, okay? 
if h is greater than one half. So what's interesting about this is this gives us a, a process that is in some sense more driven, is going to have spikier ups and downs, okay, than um, a normal random walk, okay? And that somehow models some of our notions of um, what, you know, what, of, of what market walks should look like. And that was the whole point we were look to dealing with this process to begin with is we wanted to build a model of what stock prices look like so we can build it. And recognizing that adding a component of memory gives us another way to generate walks, okay? Another tool we can use to build these things. Any questions? I think the problem also one minus H is that because we should reverse diversity. Uh, okay, so you're saying that, uh, okay, you're saying that I said, okay, the way I used it here, I conser said I kept going with probability H. And on the slide you say I have it, it reversed that way, then reverse it in one of the two, and uh, it's consistent. I think the idea is uh, basically using memory here it should make sense, okay? The notation I may have gotten wrong. Any questions? Okay? So realize that one interesting thing about random walks is this now gives us a repertoire of things we can use to uh, build models from, ideas we can use to build models from. So suppose we wanted to build a model of stock prices, okay, and using these random walks ideas to build a model of stock prices, I claim we would want to factor in the following kinds of things into our model. What kind of decisions do we have to make? One is the number of steps per simulated time period, okay? If you're simulating prices, okay, are we going to assume that uh, how many time ticks are there in a day? Is it one time tick? Is it a thousand time ticks? Is it a million time ticks? That's one decision we have to make. We have to make a decision about what is the up and down probability. Okay? Is the probability of going up the same as the probability of going down? Do we want a Hearst model or not? Okay? This is one thing we might have to figure out if we're going to build a stock price model. We want to think about what is the drift rate, okay? The models that we've talked about before, if we don't factor in drift, the expected value of where it will be t periods of time from now is the initial value, okay? If we wanted to do a simulation where there is in fact a positive drift, okay? which makes sense if we're dealing with stocks, where we think people are, there should be an appreciation. We need to include a drift rate. We need to also think about what is the step size? How much, when we make an up movement, how far up do we move at that point? Does everybody agree that about the basic step in our model? There's something going up, there's something going down. There's a probability of going up, but there's also an amount that we're going up, okay? And this should vary stock to stock somehow, right? Certain stocks are more volatile. That's really what we're now talking about here. What was volatility? We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Volatility was a measure, measure of how, how rapidly does the price change, right? Certain stocks that are very, very conservative, that, that, that have very low volatility, don't change very much. Certain other stocks, the riskier ones, jump up and down a lot, okay? Somehow, if we're modeling a risky stock, we should probably factor in higher probability, higher, the, the amount of an up movement should be greater than, a, than, than with a, a less risky stock. Does that make sense? It's not so much the probability of going up and down, but, it, but the volatility would affect how high or how low do we go, okay? And that gives us a way to customize these things. And finally, if we want to compute a price distribution of a stock, we need to worry about how many walks we use. What is the logical answer for how many walks should we use if we want to model a price distribution? Do we want to use a lot of walks? Or, you know, how many do we want to take a lot of samples or a few? 
a lot for accuracy, assuming we haven't blown past the period of our random number generator, but a little for speed, right? So that's what the trade-off issues there are. So one thing that, that we need to compute now, okay, is to think again about how do you measure how volatile a stock is. Does everybody agree that an important thing in setting this model is going to be how much is an up movement and how much is a down movement for a particular stock, okay? And it would seem silly for it to be independent of the stock, okay? Volatility, okay, is measured by the absolute value of returns, okay? Is the property of how much is it jumping around? We'll talk more about computing volatility later in the semester. But there are a couple things that are probably interesting to know. One is, if you look at the correlation between how much a stock went up today and how much it went up to the next day, that's on the right. And the correlation between how much a stock goes up with a lag of one day, two days, three days, is almost zero meaning that there is very little correlation observed, in fact, between the returns of a stock one day and the returns of the stock this, the next day. This is what we mean by markets being unpredictable, right? Okay, if you had a random sequence, the returns tomorrow should be uncorrelated with the returns today. What is more highly correlated is the volatility the amount, the percentage, let's say, that it's the absolute percentage of what it's jumping up and down. Okay? This, if you do studies on it, the amount of volatility computed today, okay, is highly correlated with the volatility 50 days from now. Okay? The amount of jumping up and down that prices do. Okay? We go through a turbulent time. Right now we're going through a turbulent time, right? The volatility of all stocks is very, very high. It's been high for a while, and it's going to stay high for a while, right? Hopefully, the world will calm down at some point, and then the volatility of stocks will drop, because we will go through, a, hopefully, a protracted period of calm. So an interesting thing about volatility is that it becomes a, um, you know, something that is correlated, and does change and can be measured. So, in our simulations, we use what we call an exponentially weighted moving average model to compute the volatility in response to each day's change. So what does this mean? Let's say that every day we look at the percentage change of a stock price. Today it went up by 1.2%. The next day it went down, it went, it first went down by 1.2%. It then went up by 0.8%. Okay? It then went up by 0.01%. We could look at this stream of percentage up movements and down movements. Okay? And take the absolute value of them. Okay? And now take some kind of an average of this over recent days to get an idea of how volatile it's going to be today. Does that make a certain amount of sense? If you want to predict, let's say, what the amount, the absolute value of today's movement is going to be, one way to do it would be to look at the historical data and take a look at the absolute values of the, of the day's movement for the last 100 days, okay? And take an average of that, and that might be an average volatility. But a better way to do it would not be to weight it at uniformly. What would be bad about averaging if we take the last 50 or 100 days and we take the observed volatility and average all of them together? Is that a good estimate of the volatility or is that likely to be, what would be the limitation of that? Okay. One thing to note is that the volatility from 50 days ago would receive equal weight in our average as the more recent observation. Okay? How do you go follow what I'm saying? 
How many people are lost? Okay, good, okay. Um, so if we take these observations, we could just take a historical average of the last several days and average them. Or we could weigh them in such a way that the more recent observations are given more weight. Does that make sense? One principled way to do that is something called an exponentially weighted moving average model. Okay? And we'll talk more about these later, but just to show you how we could compute it. We could say our estimate for the volatility is going today is going to be the estimate as of yesterday times some constant lambda plus the observed volatility yesterday, that's what I mean by un minus 1, times 1 minus lambda. So what does this kind of formula do? It says that if we have our estimate as of yesterday, we're going to multiply it by a constant less than 1. Here it was 0.94. That says our estimate of today's volatility, 94% of it will depend upon the previous estimate and 1 minus 94.94 or 0.6% of it will depend upon yesterday's estimate. And the sum of these two together gives us our estimate of today's vol uh, volatility. Okay? If we set the constant here to be zero, our observed estimate for today would all be yesterday's observation, right? This gives us a way to throttle between our uh, observation in the past and our most our estimate in the past and our most recent estimate. And what's interesting is the past becomes progressively less important. Because think about what happens with this time series as it plays out. Today, we're weighting our observation by 1 minus lambda or 0.6, or 6%, right? The next day, that 6% is folded into this. But we're multiplying that by 0.94, so it's getting slightly weaker. The next day, we're going to multiply that by 0.94. So the contributions of days, the importance of them to our computation will decrease exponentially. That's what the idea of this formula is. But this gives you a principled way to estimate what the volatility is, the percentage up or down movement we can expect today for a particular stock. Any questions? Yes? Okay, so I'm going to go through that a little bit more, a little later, but the issue here between this is whether we're talking, the square or not square, has to do with whether we're talking about variance or standard deviation. Remember what, if you remember your statistics, what is the standard deviation of something? Okay, it is the, uh, the variance is the square of the standard deviation, right? So there's a question here of whether we model, model the difference between these things as a variance or as a standard deviation. How do we want to interpret it? Okay? And usually it makes sense to interpret it in terms of standard deviations. Why is that? When we talk about the normal distribution, there is this property, and we'll talk more about the normal distribution later, but one interesting property of the normal distribution is that it's defined by a mean and a standard deviation. And a lot of the mass, the probability of being a certain distance from the mean, of getting a sample a certain distance from the mean, is a function of how many standard deviations away it is. Okay? So for now, what I really want to say is this should give us a way. Let's think about it this way. This gives us a way to measure the amount of change to estimate the amount of change. We, right now I'm thinking of it in terms of percentage change per day. We'll get more precise about what we mean by volatility later. Okay? The exponentially weighted moving average model 
Give us a way to think about how does the um, how do we estimate this value given a bunch of previous observations? Okay? And exactly what the right interpretation of this is, we'll talk about a little bit more later. Any questions? Okay? So how might we use these ideas, okay, to um, set our parameters on our random walk model? Well, if we think about it, we're going to be sampling a certain number of time steps per day, simulate a certain number of time steps per day. There is going to be a, we need an up or down movement sufficient so that the expected deviation of the up and down movements over the course of the day reflects what our observed volatility is, right? The more volatile a stock price is, the bigger the step up and down we would want at each step. One way to think about it is, if, if we expect that on average there's going to be a 1% change in the price of the stock up or down during the course of a day, then what's a reasonable way to set the step size? Well, if we know how many steps we're simulating each day, we can now know what the um, deviation from a, in a random walk mo in, a, in our, our, our random walk model. How far do we expect to get in terms of number of ticks? That gives us a way to set the tick size. Okay, is that sort of clear, or are there questions like I don't understand it? Okay. Should be clear that we have a desired amount that we want to move at the end of the day. That's what was observed by our experiment. If we've decided we're modeling it by a sequence of up and down movements, we can now work backwards to set what is the up and down movement we need. Okay? Any questions? If we do that, what we did here was we modeled each day by a st as a walk of a thousand steps. Okay? We ended up doing some experiments and we found that if we set a Hurst variable to be 0.57, meaning there was a very slight dependence on the previous step, that gave us the best results, so that's what we did. We were interested in predictions over very small periods of time, 10 days. And in this particular experiment, we didn't put in any drift, because we were looking at things over fairly small number, time periods. One factor of the world that we had to consider, though, was that a stock market is open for part of the day and then is closed for part of the day. People know that, basically, right? And you know that they always talk about the price at open. What happens to a stock price if you look at it on an exchange? Today, Today the price is going to wiggle like this. Then people are going to sleep. But during the day, while they're sleeping, the world is doing things, right? And maybe something horrible happens in the world. Or maybe something good happens. But one way or not, the price the next day should, in the morning, is going to be different than the price you could get at the night before. Does that make sense? People have had a lot of time to think about things. Things in the world may have changed. So if we're going to model what a price is doing, we have to model what is happening at night. Okay? Does the price move as much at night when the, when the market is closed or not? Okay? So we have simulated time steps in this period. We, did, we, we took a look at how much were prices moving between the close one day and the open the next day. And took a look at that as how much was the move at night versus the day. And we found that somehow that the amount of movement at night was about 50, you know, 56% of 
what we would see the day before. So you could kind of view that if you wanted to simulate what stock prices are doing. There is a time when they're open that things are changing at a certain rate. There is a time when things, at night, when things are changing at a certain rate. Okay, and you've got to sort of somehow simulate what is the virtual random walk that is happening then. And if so, you can model what's actually happening at night. Okay, by adding this into your simulation. And if you do that, you can now build a, together with this, a, a price model for what is happening to stock prices. This is a project one of my students did, something called textbiz.org. If you want to go there, you can go take a look. What did we do? We took for every stock, okay, we figured out what was its volatility. That's what the first parameter here is, volatility, Google versus General Electric. Google's volatility is higher than General Electric, okay? General Motors was much higher than everybody else. We then, on the first day of the year, simulated a year's worth of random walks in this particular picture. And based on this, you can now figure out what is the probability that the stock is at any particular price at any particular point. And that's what my green lines here are. They're sort of contour lines every 10% of the way, saying that in our simulations, 10% of the time, okay, it was, uh, I guess we have to count it, uh, between here and here. 10% of the time it was between here and here, here and here, here and here, okay? So these contour lines give us an idea of what should happen to the price of that stock if we assume that volatility, if we assume this drift, our drift here was 7%, we simulated in this case, okay? And the blue is showing the actual price movements of that stock, okay, over the course of the year, okay? Does everybody see what we sort of can get from this simulation? We can get these green contour lines, which tell us something about what is the probability that this stock will be at a particular price at a particular time. And if you look how real price distributions play out, some of them go higher, some of them go lower. That's what we would expect to have happen, okay? Because these are equal probability bins we would expect that if our simulation is right, okay, is a valid simulation, if we play out at the end of the time period, about 10% of the real paths should end up here, 10% of them should end up here, 10% of them should end up here, and so on. Any questions about what these simulations show? Okay. Yes. Okay, so you're saying now, why are these boundary conditions smooth, curved, okay? Smooth. You're saying that if I simulate a certain number of random walks, okay, this is showing somehow the 10th percentile of the random walks. And if we simulated enough random walks, we would expect this to be pretty smooth, okay? Let's think about it. Suppose we simulated a zillion random walks, right? This is showing us, this is the bound of where we would expect 90% of the time the returns after a certain date, the stock price after this date is below this line. That's what, we're, that's what this line means, right? This line is supposed to mean that according to our simulation, 90% of the time after 30 weeks, the price of General Electric will be at or below that line. That's what the interpretation of this line is, okay? If we simulated enough random walks, we would expect it to be smooth. Do you agree with that? Now you may say, well wait, you only did, it says you have 2,500 iterations. Is it really that smooth? And we probably did, you know, do something to, sim to smooth out that curve a little bit for presentation purposes. But do you agree that if we did enough random walks, that curve should be smooth? 
Okay, does that make sense or am I, you, you believe that? Okay, any questions? So this is where a random walk model is interesting. If we can predict, our models are going to be good if equal numbers of stocks end up in equal sized buckets, where these buckets are by probability. So there is more somehow price space in this bucket than this one, because this is difference between stocks in the 60th, 50th, 70th percentile and the 60th percentile. Because we expect prices to be clustered around here, we would expect these contour lines to be closer than they are for, than the ones that are further out, okay? Because they represent extreme events. Any questions? So what does this mean? Well, we, we tried to evaluate our random walk model, okay? In this case, we, with this evaluation, we did it over the next day and the next 10 days, okay? And what we found was, if you look at the 10-day one here, it's interesting. If we divided the, um, our bucket probabilities, there were 10 bucket probabilities, okay? Our predictions were that each bucket should have an equal number of prices going into it, okay? There were a certain number that were going to exceed our um, lowest bucket, which we had set up. There were a certain number of things that weren't going to move, and there were a certain number that were going to exceed our predictions. The blue represents our predicted frequencies. The reds represent our observed frequencies. And what this is supposed to show you is that even this simple model did a pretty good job of assigning, predicting, let's say, the probability distributions of stocks, okay? Because our observed bars are relatively close to our, um, what do you call it, our uh, predicted, our, our, the, the percentiles that we had defined them to be. But there are different systematic errors, okay? That we, we, we misestimate at this end, we, we, we put too few things in our buckets, and at this side we put too many things in this bucket. That's because models like this tend to over and underestimate extreme price movements. This represents bigger price movements. This represents small ones, okay? In general, these models tend to underestimate extreme movements. Any questions about that? Yeah. Same, same parameter setting here, except for each stock we had a different volatility, right? So the amount of movement that we were expecting for a highly volatile stock should be much more than a low volatile stock, right? We were trying to figure out what bucket would, you know, design the buckets for each stock so that it should be equally likely to fall into each bucket. We could then test whether or not this is true by then looking at the reality of how things played out over the next one day or ten days. Okay? Okay? So basically, this is saying basically what we did. That basically, you know, the frequency that things got in our bucket were pretty good compared to our, what we had intended. Okay? But again, they do a good job, but not a perfect job of predicting the underlying price distribution. Okay? And again, we had the same thing with closing prices, okay? This was somehow predicting what was the price of the stock going to be at 10 days, okay? And again, we found that, uh, again, the actual was here. This is what we had intended. Small price movements here, okay? Relatively small movements. We occurred more, well, some of the movements occurred in this model more often than the others. We had systematic more errors at one end of the spectrum than at the, uh, you know, there was a difference of a, 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 a whether we were near or far, okay? But the punchline here is that relatively simple random walk models of the type we've talked about can do something to predict the price distribution of underlying stocks. Does that make sense now? Any questions about this? Okay? Any questions about the experiments or the idea? Okay? So hopefully that's what we should take away from this random walk model, is this idea 
that these random walks have some predictive power. If you set up a model that even if it's just basically factoring in the amount of volatility up and down of the stock. Any questions? Okay, let's now look at another, take another look at this idea of random walks and actually end up removing the randomness from it. Okay? This gets into a, an, an important idea called the binomial tree in the, the financial pricing literature. Okay? If you take a look at one of our additive or, rand or multiplicative walks, if we have a fixed upsize and downsize at each point, what we get is not really a tree of possibilities the way we think of things in computer science as trees, but we end up getting a graph where at any point at a certain, let's look at a certain number of time steps from now, okay? At the end of one time step, we either could have gone up or we could have gone down. After two time steps, we could either have gone up twice, gone up or down, or down and up, and gone down twice. Note that somehow, whether we took this path or this path, we end up getting to the same place. Does that make sense? Okay, this is true if we view these up movements and down movements as being additions or multiplications, right? So what's interesting is this branching process that we talk about is not really so much what I would call a tree. A tree, I picture, is doing things like this because I'm a computer scientist, right? It's, a, it's sort of really a graph, some kind of a lattice-like thing, okay? Where, in some sense, the probability of getting to a node is going to be a frequency of, of the number of paths through that lattice. Does that make sense? Okay? So this kind of a structure, okay, this kind of a lattice is something called a binomial tree within the finance literature. Now why do they call it a binomial tree? Well, they call it a tree because they don't know what a tree is, right? We are computer scientists and we know what trees are, right? What's a tree? A tree is a path without cycles, right? That's not what this is, okay? But on the other hand, there is something binomial about this thing. Right? Okay? It's kind of counting the, uh, the number of, you know, basically it, it, it's, it's, you know, again, it, it has the property here where for every node, okay, there's a number of distinct paths to it. Every path to this thing from here to there is going to have the same number of up movements and down movements. Okay? In this case, it's going to have two up movements and two down movements. Okay? And this structure is an interesting structure. Why is this structure interesting? Well, one thing is, suppose I give you a path, like a, 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 a graph like this. How many paths are there if this thing has n levels? If you think about it, corresponding to n coin tosses. How many possible paths are there from here to there? Okay? If each path is a sequence of coin tosses, how many distinct paths would there be from our current point after we toss n coins? Two to the power n. Does everybody agree with that? Two to the power n is exponential, which algorithmically is not a good thing, right? But what's interesting about this structure? How many nodes does it have? If there's n levels in this thing, how many nodes are there? There's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, dot, dot, dot. That was something like n times n plus 1 over 2, right? So there's n squared nodes in this thing. And what's interesting is, this structure, which is not that big, still somehow captures 
all the paths that can be built on it, those exponential number of paths. And so what's interesting is, by thinking about this structure, we could think about doing random walks on this path structure and simulate each random walk and count how many buckets it comes up with. Or we could use this idea and compute the exact distribution of paths through this network using ideas like akin to dynamic programming that people use in algorithms. How many people here know what dynamic programming is? How many people have never heard of dynamic programming? Okay. Has everybody here heard of, of Pascal's triangle? Okay, people played with Pascal's triangle. Why did you play with it in high school? Why did you play with Pascal's triangle? It's probably a more interesting question, right? On one sense, it was easy to do, right? In a Pascal's triangle, what was it? You built this triangle of numbers, you started with one. And in general, what you did was you added up the two numbers that were right above it, right? You had these staggered uh, sort of lines of numbers. Two was equal to one plus one. Three was one plus two. Six was three plus three. Ten was four plus six, right? Why did you do this? Okay. Okay, what was the idea behind Pascal's triangle? What is it that Pascal's triangle computes? Binomial coefficients. Does everyone remember that? Then what Pascal's did was basically come up with a recurrence relation, a formula which depended upon its smaller values of itself to count, compute the binomial coefficient. N use K counts the number of ways to choose k things out of n. If I want to figure out how many groups are there here of three L and people in it, possible, who could be possible teams to do your projects together, that would be the number of students in the class, 35 choose 3, right? How do you compute what the value of n choose k is? Let's think about this. If I wanted to write a program, a function to compute n choose k. How would I do it? If you had to actually compute n choose k, how would you do it? Okay. You have to punch it on a calculator. If I asked somebody here to compute 10 choose 4, how would you go about doing it? What was it? You would say it is 10 factorial times 6 fac divided by 6 factorial, 4 factorial, right? Because in fact it is equal to n factorial divided by n minus k factorial, k factorial. But is this a good way to compute n choose k? Let's stop to think about this. Could you compute 100, choose 3, this way on your calculator, okay? You guys have calculators these days, don't you? People still have calculators, right? What happens if you compute 100 factorial? What happens? You overflow your calculator, is that right? So how would you use this formula to compute 1,000, you know, 100, choose 3? You can't do it by plugging it in your calculator. Is that clear? <coughs> okay. So what's another way to, do people see what I mean by this? If you compute the division this formula, that's going to say 100 factorial over 97 factorial times 3 factorial. Okay. If you apply it in the dumb way, you can't compute this, right? What is a smarter way to compute? 100 choose 3. What? Cancellation. You say cancellation, okay, maybe, okay, but you're still going to potentially end up with large numbers. What is a way to compute this thing where you never compute big numbers? What about if we go back to 
Pascal's triangle. Okay? When Pascal was computing this thing, if you wanted to compute a binomial coefficient using Pascal's triangle, did you ever use a big number? Let's think about it, okay? To compute any value in, a, in Pascal's triangle, what you needed were values that were above it and smaller than it, correct? At every point in the relevant part of Pascal's triangle, if you want to compute a particular binomial coefficient, it depended upon the two ones that were above it, which were the two ones above it, which were the two ones above it, right? And so what was interesting about this method is in fact you never computed a bigger number than the actual final binomial coefficient. Is that right? People sort of see that? See what I'm saying here? So, Pascal's way of computing binomial coefficients is interesting because it avoids overflow. But even more interesting, okay, because it's going to provide us an example of how you compute things given by recurrence relations like this. Okay? How did Pascal compute n cubes k? Pascal observed that n cubes k was equal to n minus 1 choose k minus 1 plus n minus 1 choose k. Why is this what Pascal was doing? Well, look back here. This is saying that the value of this is the sum of the two previous values, right? This is the value on the nth row is the sum of two values on the n minus first row, right? And if you play with the indices, this is exactly what you get, okay? Any questions? The other way to think about this recurrence, I know you've probably seen it before, is why does it work? If n choose k counts the number of subsets of n of k things chosen from n, if I have a subset of k things chosen from n, either it includes the nth element or it doesn't. Does that make sense? If it includes the nth element, then I need to get k minus 1 other elements from the numbers 1 to n minus 1 to finish the job. If it has, does not include the nth element, I need to get k elements from 1 to n minus 1 to finish the job. And this recurrence gives us a way to compute that. Okay? Any questions about binomial coefficients? Okay? Any questions? Here is how I would compute binomial coefficients to avoid overflow. Okay? Which is basically just implement that recurrence. Binomial coefficient ij is the sum of binomial coefficient i minus 1, j minus 1, i minus 1, j. Assuming I have those smaller ones already computed. And by doing my iteration in the appropriate way and setting my initial boundary conditions, I will have those values. Okay? And this then gives me an efficient way to evaluate that recurrence. Any questions about this? Okay, this is in some sense elementary computer science. But it is also some sense a review of this idea of dynamic programming. Computing something by storing previous partial results. Okay, any questions? So let's go through our binomial tree structure and try to compute the final price distribution, okay, exactly, instead of by using a random walks idea, or the, the distribution of random walks, but compute what that distribution is exactly, instead of through random sampling. Note that if we have one of these binomial tree structures, If 
I have a binomial free structure, let's think about this. If I want to compute what the probability distribution is in any node, okay, I claim what is the probability of ending up at this node? I claim it depends upon two things. It depends upon the probability of going from this state to there, which is a function of this edge probability. Let's say there was a probability p of an upward movement and 1 minus p of a downward movement, right? The probability of ending up at this state was what? It was 1 times p times 1 minus p times the probability of being at this state. Does everybody see that? Plus p times the probability of having been at this state. The interesting thing is we can modify, take the same idea as that basic binomial recurrence, and now, for any particular node, we compute the probability of getting there, okay, as a function of the probabilities of the previous state times the transition probabilities. Does everybody see that? Now let's think about this. Suppose I build, give you a binary or a random walk of, let's say, uh, 10 steps. And I want to compute, given the edge probabilities, what is the probability of reaching each stage? I could do that by simulating random walks and counting how often do I end up in each bucket. Or I could say the probability of being in this state is initially 1. The probability of getting from here to here is p. There's a probability p is here, 1 minus p of being here. By projecting out those probabilities, I can compute the exact probability distribution without needing the random walk sampling. Does that make sense now? Any questions about that? So what's, one of the interesting ideas with this thing is that these binomial trees give us an efficient way to compute path distributions. Okay, exactly. Provided you know what the outgoing edge probabilities are at every single point. Okay, any questions? Does this model still work if I have a different transition probability at every edge pair? Certainly I could have this be P and 1 minus P. I could have this be Q and 1 minus Q. I could add what, have whatever probabilities I want at every step. Okay? And this model would compute the exact distribution of paths at the end of that. Any questions? Okay? So part of the idea of binomial trees is it gives us a way to compute these things exactly without random sampling. Okay? Any questions? But there's one question that we need here still. Okay? Which is a question of if I want to really price a stock or price an option, what is the should be the up probability and what is the down probability? Okay? Here, let me say, let me make the transition here. We're now changing to a different kind of an idea. Does everybody, before I move forward, does everybody see how we can use dynamic programming, this idea, to evaluate the path distribution exactly, rather than by random sampling? How many people see that? How many people don't see that? I want to ask a question. Okay, let me ask again. I have absolutely no response. I don't know if that means that you guys are being like Lehman, or whatever it is here. Okay? Do people see now the algorithmic idea that given one of these binomial trees and given the probabilities of each edge transition, do people see how you can compute the price distribution at the end exactly? How many people see that? How many people don't see that? Okay, so everyone should see, yes, if random walks were a good idea, these are a good idea, right? That should be clear, okay? 
let me carry this idea a little further now, okay? Which is going to get to one other question that's, that's, that, that's, that's interesting and surprising you can come up with an answer for. If you think about this mod, kind of a model for stocks, what should be the up probability and what should be the down probability? Let's think about it. Okay? Does someone want to, what would be the most logical up and down probabilities to think about? The first guess would be one half up and one half down at each step, right? Why do we say that? Well, because that's the obvious thing to say, right? It would be nice in building one of these models if we could come up with a more principled idea as to what the probability of going up in one step is, okay, than that, okay? And what's interesting is this binomial tree idea somehow is going to give us an idea, another way to set these probabilities in a principled and interesting way, okay? So I'd like to clear our heads for a minute about the computational idea of how we go through these paths. And think now a little bit about what is our question if we're setting up one of these graphs. What should be the uptick probability versus the downtick probability? What's interesting is there is an argument we can use from arbitrage theory, okay? to set that up probability or down probability as a function of the risk neutral rate. Remember, everything in the world depends upon interest rates. One argument that's surprising is maybe that upward step or downward step should also depend upon the interest rate. Okay? Let's think about the following idea. Suppose we live in a world where this was reality. This kind of an up and down model was reality. In particular, let's say that we lived in a world where our tree had only one step in it. Here we are here. Okay? We have a stock that we're trying to figure out. Okay? And um, I have a stock that's going to, that, that uh, is either going to go up or down, okay, in one step, what should the probabilities be? Okay, let's look at this argument here. Suppose, let's say, that at one point if I have a dollar, I could do one of two things with my dollar. I could either put it in the bank at the risk-free rate, or I could use it to buy stock, okay? There's a one dollar stock out there. Which would be a better thing to do with my dollar? I have two possible choices. One would be to put it in a bank where my one dollar, if I earn it at an interest rate of R, is going to at the end of it give me one plus uh, R, right? Suppose instead I lived in a world where there were two possible steps. There was an up step and a down step, okay? And there was a probability beta of an up step and one minus beta of a down step. What would my return be on this stock, on this model, okay? If we lived in a world where, as in our simulation over this time period, only one of two things can happen. It could go up by one step or go down by one step. What would be the value of this? I start out with one dollar of stock. I put it into my stock. What would be my expected return from this? My return from this? It should be that at, at a price of beta, with a probability of beta, I'm going to make a return of u, right? And then with a probability of 1 minus beta, I'm going to lose d. 
Does everybody agree with that? That if I had a reality that was played out as one step of this thing, if I have the stock, and the stock is observing this model, I know what the probability distribution of this is. Okay? I know on my returns. I know what my return is if I put it in the bank. Okay? Is everybody okay, any questions? I can take my one dollar and put it into two different portfolios. Which one of these portfolios is better? Okay? This is what I get if I leave it in the bank. This is what I would get if I put it in the stock and the stock obeyed my model. Does everybody agree with that? Now what's interesting about this? If I didn't care about risk, okay, if I didn't care at all about risk, the value of this portfolio should be the same as the value of that portfolio. Why is that? Because somehow the stock, again, if, if these portfolios are equally valuable and I didn't care about risk, what does that mean? That means the return of this, okay, should be equal to the return given by this model. If I, my up constant and down constant are fixed, by setting these two things equal to each other, I can now solve for this beta and in a principled way come up with what that upward movement is, that, that, that upward probability is, okay? And that is this idea of risk-neutral probabilities. Any questions? Okay, I can tell I said that badly. Okay, and we're going to go through this more deeply next class. Let me just try one more time now to get this idea across. If we want to come up with a principled way, let's say that we have, want to build a stock model where we set these probabilities in a principled way. Okay? If in one time step, we either go up by U or down by D, and these are constants, these are already set, right? What should that model be? That value, there's one parameter that's left in our model, this probability of going up or down. If holding a risk neutral, if we didn't care about risk, we could earn a return on one dollar at the risk-free rate by putting it in the bank. Or we could earn a return at, uh, by taking that one dollar and putting it in the stock. The return we would expect from the stock has got to be beta times the value gained by the upward move minus u the downward move times the probability of that downward move, which was 1 minus beta. But if we didn't care about what, which profile, which portfolio we've got, this one or that one, the value of them is somehow the same. And setting this value equal to that value, we have an equation with one variable, this beta. And that gives us, in principle, a way to set this probability. Okay? Any questions about that? Let's think about it. Next class, we're going to get in more deeply into this idea of risk-neutral valuation. Okay? We're going to use these arbitrage arguments to talk about how we can actually set these probabilities in a principled way. Any questions? Okay. The last thing I'd like to do is urge people again, everybody, we talked the, the business school is having a, um, a presentation today at 3.45 on the collapse in the markets. And I want everybody to go. I'm officially going to say this is a required thing, okay? So I want everybody to go, okay, to this thing, okay? And um, it's in the Lam Wu Lecture Theater, okay? And um, it's officially required now, okay? Any questions about it?
Thanks for your attention, and we'll talk more about this on Tuesday.